Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Finance Friday. This is another special edition of Money Girl, where I answer your burning money questions. Today, we've got a great question that came in from Elaine. She says, I'm retired and have Social Security benefits, a pension, savings, and a traditional IRA. About six years ago, I bought some real estate stock that went up, and I'm thinking about cashing it out. What taxes would I owe on the sale? And how should I reinvest the money? Elaine, thank you so much. I will review what tax you must pay on various investments and recommend some options to consider when you have extra cash in retirement. I appreciate you joining me this week. My name is Laura Adams. I'm a personal finance author, spokesperson, money speaker, founder of the Money Stack newsletter, and host of the Money Girl podcast with 43 million downloads. If you're not already subscribed here to the show in whatever app you're using right now, that's the best way to ensure you never miss an episode. We're doing two a week on Wednesdays and Fridays. And by the way, if you have a question you'd like me to cover on a Finance Friday show, please Please leave it on our voicemail line. You can call 302-364-0308, or you can send an email using my contact page at lauradadams.com. While you're there, you can sign up for the Money Stack newsletter for free. All right, let's get into investment taxes. I know this may not seem like the most exciting topic, but it certainly affects all of us who invest. And anytime you're fortunate enough to make money, whether it's from an employer, your own business, or an investment, you typically owe taxes. So it's good to understand, you know, how the taxes work and what they might be. For 2024, your ordinary income is taxable according to seven brackets, and they range from 10% all the way up to 37%. So some examples of your ordinary income include wages, salaries, tips, bonuses, commissions, rents, royalties, short-term capital gains, unqualified dividends, and interest income. And we'll talk more about those last three, the capital gains, dividends, and interest income, because those fall under uh, investment income. So there are certain types of investment income, including long-term capital gains and qualified dividends that get taxed differently. And some taxes are due only if you choose to sell an investment for a profit, and others are due when you get paid a distribution. And we'll talk more about that. Another huge consideration is the type of account where you own an investment. For instance, with a tax-advantaged account like a traditional 401k, you only owe taxes once you take withdrawals in retirement. Or with a Roth IRA, you get tax-free withdrawals in retirement if you own the account for at least five years. But for capital assets like a home or investments that you own inside a taxable account, like a brokerage, taxes are due when you earn money from those investments. And the tax rate you must pay depends on various factors that we're going to cover here. So we're going to talk about three main types of investment income, which are capital gains, dividends, and interest. So let's start with capital gains. As I mentioned, this happens when you choose to sell an asset. It could be a stock. It could be a home. um, You know, it could be some collectibles for more than you paid for it. So your profit minus your cost basis is called a capital gain. For instance, let's say you buy one share of stock for $20, and then later on you sell it for $30. Well, you have made a $10 capital gain. Your profit minus your cost basis is your capital gain. Now, remember that a capital gain is only taxable if you realize it by selling the asset. So if you have a stock that goes up in value from $20 to $30, That's not realized. It's unrealized. You're just watching your asset appreciate, and you don't have to pay capital gains on that appreciation until you sell it. Selling it locks in that gain. That's when it is taxable. So if you sell and you have a $10 gain on that share of stock, you would owe capital gains tax on the entire amount, on the entire $10. 
If you own the share for more than a year before selling it, you would have what's called a long-term capital gain, which gets taxed at reduced favorable rates. And currently, those rates range from 0% all the way up to 23.8%, depending on your total taxable income and your tax filing status. And I want to note that some investments actually have higher capital gains tax rates. For instance, collectibles like Rare coins and art typically have a long-term capital gains tax rate of 28%. Now, Elaine mentioned owning her stock for six years, so she would owe long-term capital gains on the sale unless she owns that stock inside a retirement account. But we're going to assume that she doesn't because she doesn't didn't mention that. We're going to assume that she owns it in a taxable brokerage account. Her tax rate depends on her tax filing status and on her total income. For instance, let's say Elaine is single and she has taxable income up to about $47,000. In that case, she would owe zero capital gains on her stock sale. But if her taxable income is higher, if it's over $47,025 to be exact, but it's under $518,900, she would owe 15% on her gain. So that's a very common capital gains tax rate for most people. But Elaine could consult with a tax professional to estimate her tax liability on the potential stock sale before deciding whether to sell or keep it if paying that capital gains tax is a concern for her. Now, owning an asset for less than a year means any capital gain is considered short term. That means it is taxed at the higher ordinary income tax rates, which, as I mentioned, range from 10 percent all the way up to 37 percent. So owning an asset for longer than a year definitely helps minimize your taxes. Also, if you have a capital loss on an investment, in other words, if you sell it and you lose money, you may be able to offset other gains or even take a tax deduction depending on your situation. But you can never claim a capital loss when selling a home. Remember that. So let's talk about the capital gains taxes on a home sale. Uh, As I mentioned, when you do that for a profit, it also creates a capital gain for income tax purposes. However, if you follow specific IRS rules, there is a unique home sale gains exemption, and that's up to $250,000 of gain if you're a single taxpayer or up to $500,000 if you are married filing a joint tax return. And the primary rule is that the home must be your primary residence and you must have lived in the property for at least two of the previous five years to qualify for this capital gains exemption. So for instance, let's say you qualify and you purchased your home for $300,000 and lived in the home and then sold it 10 years later for $500,000. Your entire $200,000 of gain would be tax-free if you meet the ownership requirements. And if you want to learn more about this exemption, I would encourage you to listen to podcast number 826 called What Tax Do I Owe on My Home Sale? Okay, that's the basics for capital gains. Now let's talk about investment dividends. This is the second type of investment income you might have, and it comes from owning shares of dividend-paying stocks. So a company can reinvest its profits into the business or pay it to shareholders as dividends. Now, not all stocks pay dividends, but many mature companies pay consistent dividends that can even increase over time. For instance, Caterpillar, which goes by the trading symbol CAT, pays a dividend yield of 1.57%. And the yield represents a stock's annual dividend amount divided by its current price per share. But the big takeaway here is just to remember that some stocks do pay a dividend. And if you own one of them, you automatically receive the dividend when a company declares one. And you can take that dividend in cash 
or reinvest it into the company by purchasing more shares. Either way, you owe taxes if you own a dividend stock in a taxable brokerage account. For instance, if you receive $100 monthly from a dividend stock, you'll receive a statement from the company at the end of the year showing that they paid you a dividend income of $1,200. And dividends can be qualified for special tax treatment if you own the investment for more than 60 days. And that means you pay taxes based on those capital gains tax rates that I mentioned that range from zero up to 23.8%, depending on your total taxable income. But as I mentioned, non-qualified dividends, these are the ones that you own for less than 60 days. Those get taxed at your ordinary tax rate, which is typically higher. And just to repeat the point, if you own a dividend stock in a retirement account, the income gets shielded from tax either temporarily in a traditional account or forever in a Roth retirement account. And the last type of income that many people earn is interest income. So this could come from a bank savings account, maybe a CD that you purchased, or a bond investment. And all of these are usually taxed as ordinary income when you own it inside a taxable brokerage or just a regular bank account. Now, there is an exception for interest on bonds issued by states and municipalities, which are exempt from federal income tax. And you might also get a break on state income taxes on certain investments such as treasury bonds. And speaking of states, be aware that your home state may have its own taxes on investment earnings in addition to the federal rates that I've talked about here. So always speak with a local tax advisor about your situation if you have questions on investment income. So Elaine's tax on her stock sale is going to depend on her tax filing status and her income, and it will be taxed at the long-term capital gains rate. So as I mentioned, it would probably be 0 or 15%, unless she's got a lot more income than she mentioned. Now, Elaine also asked what to do with her cash if she sells her stock. Well, depending on her financial picture, she could add it to her savings, use it to pay down debt invest it, or maybe use it to reduce her future taxes. So assuming Elaine has no high interest debt, she might want to boost her savings balance. That's always a safe choice, especially for retirees. Having at least a year's worth of living expenses sitting in an FDIC-insured high-yield savings account is very wise. But if she already has enough savings, Elaine could shop for a higher-rate CD. Now, if Elaine feels good about her savings and her retirement income, another option is to create a plan for doing Roth conversions over multiple years. Roth conversions is a strategy where you move money from a traditional retirement account, you pay taxes on the withdrawal, and then you move it over to an after-tax Roth IRA. And the whole purpose of doing that is reducing your future taxes. Everyone has required minimum distributions from a traditional retirement account. So when you reduce that balance, you're taking a little bit more control over the amount of taxable income you may have in the future. It's also a wise move if you believe your current tax rate is lower than it will be in the future. So, you know, maybe if you are going to have higher income in the future or you just think all Americans' tax rates are going to go up in the future. But it's really critical to be mindful of how Roth conversions increase your taxable income in the current year and to have a plan to stay in the lowest tax bracket that is possible. So you want to consult a financial advisor to calculate Roth conversion thresholds and come up with a plan that really makes sense for your level of income. Also, Elaine didn't mention having a Roth IRA, so she would need to open one to do Roth conversions. And depending on her comfort with risk, she could put her Roth conversions in a safe vehicle like a CD or a money market account. Or if she wants some growth, she could invest it in a total market index or exchange traded fund inside the Roth IRA. 
And maybe Elaine is considering leaving money to heirs. If so, making them a beneficiary of a Roth IRA is an excellent way to pass along tax-free money to future generations. Elaine, I hope this has been helpful. And for everyone else, I hope this has been a good primer on how your ordinary income and investment income gets taxed. That's all for now, and I'll talk to you soon. Until then, here's to living a richer life. Money Girl is a quick and dirty tips podcast. It's audio engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Our director of podcast is Brandon Gaitchus. Our digital operations specialist is Holly Hutchins. Our advertising operations specialist is Morgan Christensen. And our marketing and publicity associate is Davina Tomlin. Mm-hmm.